So my name is Andrew Young. Uh, I enjoy making up words and coining new phrases all the time, how for those of you, you who know me. So should my title here should show you just how excited I am about this talk. <laughs> is that not working? Check one, two. There you go. There we go. OK. All right, so let's get started. So rough, roughly speaking, I'm going to sort of give my own past, present, and future look, at least uh, from a Sandia perspective and a DOE perspective on uh, what we've been doing with singularity and containers. So I'll talk uh, very briefly because it's probably review for most people, especially if you've seen any of my previous slides about, you know, why we care about containers and HPC and some of the, you know, initial vision that we had for using uh, Singularity. Uh, I'll talk briefly about some previous work that I've done that's now probably two years old, if not actually more, uh, regarding Singularity on a Cray test bed. I'll talk as much as I can about some of our uh, Mission HPC apps um, running on our production clusters. And then I'll dive into, hopefully if I have enough time, uh, some of the efforts in terms of the DOE Exascale. Uh, project. So, and then what, you know, because this is a user group meeting, feel free to stop me, just shout, raise your hand, whatever. Let's have a conversation rather than me killing you with PowerPoint. Um, but at the end, if we still have time, I'll dive into what I think the future directions are for a lot of the, the work over the next couple of years. So, very briefly, boy, it'd be really nice if I could support software development and testing on laptops that could then seamlessly scale to some of the world's largest supercomputers. It's essentially one of the main goals that we're really looking at. Um, you know, the development time on supercomputers is uh, often hard to get and incredibly expensive. So wouldn't it be nice if we could offload some of that? We actually build entire test beds and smaller uh, clusters just to support the development efforts for then running on larger uh, sets of computers. We really want to give control back to developers in terms of how they build their environment and their application. Um, and, and this needs to be a system in which we can support multiple different architectures and, you know, potentially compilers as well. Um, you know, we have a, a, a pretty diverse set of ecosystem, uh, a diverse ecosystem across HPC from, you know, even just within the x86 between Skylake and Knight's Landing. We kind of bought a couple tens of thousands of those. Uh, with our partner up the hill, ARM, Power9, and whatever Exascale may hold for us. So um, we need to embrace that, that diversity. Um, and performance matters. That, that P stands for performance in HPC, and we can't lose that. So why do we care about containers in HPC? This is my own take, uh, you know, the sort of BYOE, but let's bring our own environment um, and, and let developers determine that. We really want to define and uh, you know, define exactly what that ecosystem is, and maybe we have some sense of portability. Again, I talk about this laptop to supercomputer, uh, but also potentially, what about supercomputer to supercomputer? Um, and uh, you know, encouraging more people to use proper version control and you know, Git-based systems is a good thing. So this should be all review. I'm going to go really quickly through this. Uh, there's many different container options. You guys have probably all know this. Uh, you know, Docker, Shifter, Singularity, Charlie Cloud. There's a new one every day. I think Greg showed me this cool thing where you can write your own container runtime in like 50 something lines ago. Um, the simple story is Docker isn't a good fit for our HPC environments. Um, there's a myriad of things, and we could have an entire separate talk on why this is, but it's Suffice it to say, there's little integration with how HPC currently works, and there's significant security issues with running Docker as is. And we found Singularity is our best fit. Um, it's open source, it's publicly available. Uh, when I break something, I could pick up a red phone and call one of these guys here. That's pretty nice. Um, I, you know, we really like the simple image management plan, uh, and there's support for multiple architectures, which, as you'll find, becomes really important. Um, and obviously, community support. It's really nice to be able to come and hear everybody's different story and um, understand how everybody else is using this, because that gives me a lot to come back to my home lab and say, hey, look, have you guys tried this yet? So um, hopefully you guys you know, get some of that as well. So 
DevOps. Everybody has their own definition of DevOps, but this is sort of the model that we started putting together where let's just use Docker at first and build something on your laptop, put it to some container registry service, and then I can push this out and run this container image on multiple different systems, whether it's a commodity cluster, Amazon EC2, or a Cray. Um, and, and this model has changed a little bit, obviously, since this was originally defined a couple of years ago. But I think a lot of this general practice still holds true. Um, and this is a really powerful notion for our, our developers. So I mentioned this, this work is a little old. Um, but it's good to talk about anyways. So we first focused on Cray just as an initial experiment to say how, how much can we you know, really leverage this singularity runtime you know, a couple years ago. So we basically hacked up our Cray testbed at the time on an open system um, which was running CLE5 and uh, added the necessary support for running and using singularity. Um, and hacked up LD, LD library path. If anybody's actually worked with CLE5, they know exactly how nasty this is. Now I just get an RPM and install it, <laughs> which is much, much nicer. But um, this didn't used to be the case. So we then, once we did all that, we kind of asked the obvious question of, well, you know, how does you know, running you know, a singularity uh, on a Cray compared to running with Docker in a cloud environment. So we quickly you know, hacked together this uh, quick little experiment where we ran uh, bas basically some simple benchmarks, HPCG. Who's, who's actually heard of HPCG? OK, we got some people. So everybody probably knows Limpack. That's the way we calculate flops. Uh, that's really great for a first affront on you know, understanding performance from an HPC system. However, our, our mission apps that we, we actually care about don't really correlate to Limpack, at least today. Um, HPCG, on the other hand, is much more representative of the things that we care about in, H, in HPC. So uh, that's H, high performance conjugate gradient. Um, uh, so we started to run that as well as some initial benchmarks across basically two systems. So this Cray XE30 that we hacked up. Um, which is old at this point, Ivy Bridge, and then we created as close as we could to its analogy in the Amazon EC2 world. Um, it's not exact, this is still apples to oranges, um, but it certainly was an interesting uh, attempt. And, you know, this only cost us $176 an hour, which sounds pretty cheap, but if you calculate out that out to every, you know, hour of a year, that comes up to what, I think one and a half, two million dollars. So um, I didn't spend that much on this little test bed cray. So, <laughs> um, so what do we find? Well, oh, I should also mention I used to be a virtualization person, or I, I guess I still am, but um, I also hacked up KVM to run on the cray as well at the same time, and uh, also included that in some of our experiments. So what does HPC look like when we start to scale it? And we found uh, pretty obvious results. You know, it turns out at a couple of cores or, you know, several dozen cores, you know, this all looks about the same. We're only working on a couple of nodes here. However, as you start to increase your scale, we watch the, you know, the, Am the Amazon EC2 instances fall off a cliff. But, you know, just scaling up to 768 cores, which is not a lot, no nor, you know, nowhere, nowhere close to what we actually would run at for a full capability class run. You know, we're only seeing 72, 73% of our performance versus using Singularity. And when we configured Singularity correctly, we got 99.8% of the performance compared to running natively. So you ask, well, why is this? Turns out HPCG is not that sensitive to your, to your network. Um, it, you know, it, it is to some degree, but that's not the primary driver. So um, when you actually just look at running IMB benchmark, just, you know, simple MPI benchmarks, we see that you know, the overhead is really quite drastic with Amazon EC2. Um, and there is overhead when we use Singularity with Cray's MPI. You know, we saw about a, you know, 12%, 11% performance degradation. Turns out that's just the cost of dynamically linking your application rather than static, static compilation. So if you're compiling or if you're doing di dynamic compilation anyways, you're paying this penalty. But if you truly want the best point-to-point you know, performance, 
on, say, an 8-byte all-reduce, which I think that's what, yeah, this is an all-reduce, um, you know, you should statically compile your app. But in reality, this doesn't really affect anything. We're still doing orders of magnitude better than, um, you know, Amazon EC2. So um, this, this, these results are in this paper that's now pretty old, but um, feel free to reference that. So, okay, great. We showed that we can run Singularity on a Cray XC30. Isn't that fantastic? Um, performance can be near native. However, you know, a lot of the details were hidden, and this really depends on the uh, strict reliance on MPI, ABI compatibility. The fact that I was able to build my container with regular M pitch and at runtime swap that out for Cray's MPI, which knew exactly how to use the Aries inter interconnect in the most performant way. Um, that really is why it's performant. Singularity itself is getting, getting out of the way pretty well. Um, so it's pretty obvious that interoperability is going to be a key thing moving forward. And instead of me designing these containers, yes, I would like my uh, you know, developers to, to create these as well, and they do. But it'd be nice if that's a two-way street and a communication between the vendors. So this is something that I'm currently pushing, and I'd like to see other people's thoughts in this. Would you actually want a Cray provided, you know, uh, base container that you then modify or add on or something like that? If so, go ask Cray <laughs> or HPE or IBM or whoever, you know, Lenovo, whoever you're going to buy your next major HPC machine from. And is there something that we can do from a community standpoint on limiting our risk when it comes to ABI compatibility? We're really relying on the MPI guys to not break ABI compatibility. Is that, is that wise? So. so, okay, that's some initial benchmarks and some mini apps. What about actually running a production-based workload in a production environment? Those are sort of two totally different things. Um, and what are, what are going to be our metrics, metrics for success? So we moved to this, you know, horribly named machine called Doom. Uh, <laughs> Everybody likes Doom or has played Doom. Uh, hopefully this excites you. But this is what's called a CTS machine from the Trilabs perspective. There are, oh, I don't know, six, nine near identical machines in the top 500 within the top 100 that are CTS-based machines. Basically, each of the Trilabs, so Sandia, Los Alamos, and Livermore, each have multiple instances of all of these. Um, but they're basically just Broadwell commodity um, uh, clusters, if you will, but they're meant to run our, you know, uh, capacity-based production workloads. So, we, you know, t started with Doom, and uh, I'm able to talk about this thing called Nalu. It's an open source and publicly freely available uh, application. It's actually part of the ExaWind uh, project, so it'll be a exascale application, but. For all intents and purposes, this is a really nice open source tool that represents uh, a lot of the uh, vast requirements for our uh, ASC mission integrated codes. So uh, if, if I can demonstrate that I can run Nalu, I can run a lot of other things that are, that are uh, mission relevant to Sandia and the Trilabs. Um, and we uh, basically borrowed a lot of our initial milestone uh, tests from Trinity. Who's actually heard of Trinity? Okay, so you guys know roughly. Trinity is this big Cray system that uh, we co-share with Los Alamos. It lives up in Los Alamos, and it's a dual uh, Haswell KNL uh, machine. Uh, and so we basically borrowed a lot of the acceptance criteria for uh, Nalu, and and brought it into this set and said, well, all right, if I can demonstrate that I can run Nalu, and uh, with these problems at the scale, that's going to show us something. So, uh, just really quickly. We wanted to measure just the, uh, the total wall clock time, but we also wanted to pay attention to the uh, resident memory set. I don't know if anybody's looked at this yet, but we actually found some interesting results here, and I wanted to share this with this community just so we could iterate a little bit on this. But um, we, you know, this essentially looks like an MPI exec, call singularity, load up bash, we do some LD preload. Uh, you know, craziness, and then run this Nalu application. Um, and we're using LD Pixie to, to um, you know, work our way in here. 
In terms of this crazy Nalu container, what does it look like? Uh, basically, it's TOS, um, or we're running TOS on Doom. TOS really is just um, you know, a functional equivalent to RHEL. So just assume that's Red Hat. Uh, we're using GNU 7.3 and OpenMPI 2.1.1. I tried with 2.1.2, and that, of course, broke in the container because uh, 2.1.1 and 2.1.2 are not ABI compatible. This is why I say we really need to pay close attention and be more vigilant when it comes to ABI compatibility with MPI. But anyways, um, there is a large set of uh, third-party library dependencies that are required just to build um, you know, this, this software stack in a container. Uh, Trilinos alone requires, you know, 10 gigs of RAM and uh, about four and a half, five hours with minimal settings just to build. So that's not run, just to build. Um, so this container takes a while. It's actually pretty small. I think it's only a couple of gigs, but, you know, and that's bringing along all my libraries included with this. But generally, this should be all fairly common in um, obvious open, you know, open source software stacks here. So what happens when we actually run it? Well, we found some, some cool things. So this is from a, an old neck deck talk. But basically, we found that, so for this one problem, that's an acceptance criteria. Um, we found that as we scaled up, uh, our Singularity container ran a little faster than native. Well, that's cool, I think. <laughs> um, it wasn't too terribly much. Again, when you actually look at it in terms of, you know, just a normal uh, linear scale, you, you can barely notice the difference. But you know, plotting the, uh, the speed up, you do see it a little bit. And the more interesting that we found, th the other interesting thing that we found is that uh, our, our memory overhead is um, not huge, but, but noticeable. And, and again, I'm really curious if anybody else has looked at this yet. This will require further investigation, I think. But we basically found that on a per MPI rank perspective, we were using a little more memory. Um, I'd like to dive into this more with anybody offline, but this, this seems to be an, a potential source of overhead here. Um, so yeah, my container version of Nalu was faster but used more memory. What? <laughs> um, as far as I can tell, this is my best guess thus far, um, but I'm actually using uh, GCC 7.2 and I was building OpenMPI from GCC 7.2, and this brought in some extra little special sauces that I didn't even realize. Um, sp specifically, when you build OpenMPI, at least OpenMPI 2, with a, a higher order GNU compiler, you get, you know, ver I think it's over version 5, you get um, the new MPI Fortran 2008. Uh, uh, libraries as well, and that, speed th that speeds things up a little bit in some cases that apparently we're hitting. Also, our, our libraries are a little larger, so that may account for some of that. So actually, you know, putting those in resident memory, that may impact it. And I, you know, throughout my container build, used uh, position-independent code because this is, you know, just a standard Broadwell x86-64, and you should be doing uh, pick for most of your compilation. Um, and there was some overhead in, you know, hacking up LD library path and loading, you know, via bash before actually starting my MPI process, but that's not too terribly much. I mention this because it, it's a really good indication of sort of the power and pitfalls of, of using containers. I actually let my, this was not something that we did on purpose. This was purely an accident and I said, here, I went to my expert, my Nalu expert at my lab and said, build this in a container, and this is how they did it, and ended up running faster. Um, I, I think that's really, that shows a lot of the power that we have with containers and really handing that back to the developers and the people who know best how to run these things, rather than, you know, sysadmins or vendors or, you know, crazy research scientists like myself. So, um, but you got to be careful. We really have to pay attention about what we're doing. So, so this is an interesting set on some of our x86 uh, machines of interest. Uh, we also have spent a little bit of time building this ARM supercomputer uh, at, at Sandia. It's called Astra. Maybe somebody's heard about it or not. We actually got it up on the top 500. Um, and we are running Singularity 3 now as of, I think I installed it last week. So 
Um, you should see a lot of these same experiments being repeated for ARM. Um, we're really excited about this. There's a whole lot more work to, go, to do here, um, not only in just maturing the ARM ecosystem, but also ensuring that you know, I can run container images uh, efficiently. And, and this is where sort of some of these new features that I think you heard about earlier today, specifically the remote build service, become really important. Until Apple builds me an ARM-based you know, Mac laptop, it's really hard for me to create an ARM container without you know, targeting some remote build. So uh, we're excited to explore that in greater detail as well. But if you want to talk about this machine off offline, feel free to come grab me. The other thing that's, I think, important to, to know, and I'll talk around this more than at this, <laughs> um, is that you know, we're able to build our containers on, on our open networks and our restricted networks and then move them to, let, let, let's say, air gap networks uh, with, with relative ease here. We have the necessary security plans in place, and this is something that we can do. Um, this works really well with the singularity image format. I don't have to upload a bazillion different layers. I've got one file, and this is the thing that everybody pays attention to. I can mount this maybe in a sandbox and do some QA and testing against this. And now I have this in uh, such a format that I could push and transfer into my air gap network and, uh, and, and run. Um, on a let's, let's call it production network. Um, so this is, this is a really nice feature that I think we happen to get and we happen to benefit from um, by using Singularity in this case over anything else. So that's great. Okay, so that sort of brings us to the present. We've shown that we can hack up some craze and you know, uh, we can run some basic benchmarks. We've demonstrated that we can run mission apps of interest on you know, classic clusters that we have across uh, the DUE and NSA. But what happens when we move towards exascale? What's the future really going to look like here? Um, and that is an open question that I, I know I'm not the only one that, who, there are many people who are going to be worrying about this. Um, I'm only one of them. But I'm going to talk a little bit about my perspective. Um, and this is where I get to make up this funny term of super containers and hopefully I'm not stomping on that term too terribly bad. But it's pretty obvious that not only at Sandia and the Trilabs, but across the DOE enterprise as a whole, containers have really uh, picked up in terms of uh, you know, interest and gained significant interest across the ECP. I think we're going to hear later from Argon and, and Oak Ridge on, on this exact topic. Um, there exists several runtimes today. While Singularity is great, um, there's, there's other ones too from our sister labs, Shifter and, uh, and Charlie Cloud. Um, I can't really tell what, I can't tell LANL what they should or shouldn't run. That's up to LANL, for instance. Um, however, what I, what I do have to care about is ensuring that I can create a container instance in, a, in an image that I can run on multiple different runtimes. That is something that is going to be of key uh, importance for us in the near future. So interoperability and flexibility is something that I really need to start caring about today. Um, and there's several other challenges just when it comes to the run times. Uh, you know, it, will this stuff scale? I've, are, great, I've run a container to a couple hundred nodes or maybe a thousand nodes. What happens when I'm talking about exascale? You know, or some of that new hardware that uh, we're supposed to see just in the next couple of years. How do I deal with resource management? I, I think you know, Rolf and I really <coughs> need to talk more about PIMIX. Um, and again, how do I do this in an interoperable way? How do I create a container that I can run at scale with, uh, you know, with singularity and then still have some notion that I could run this in a Charlie Cloud environment if, if I needed to? Um, and how do I really ensure that this integrates at exascale? So quick definition if nobody has heard of the exascale computing project. Um, that's, yeah, I just kind of threw it up there, but, um, so we, I think it is now, it is now on, we are responsible, we've got this new ECP super containers uh, project that is going to be looking at all this in great detail, uh, painstaking detail, perhaps. Um, it's a joint effort across, uh, uh, some of my colleagues and I at Sandia, as well as Los Alamos, uh, Berkeley, Livermore, and, uh, University of Oregon. And really, as I mentioned, we're going to be focusing on 
building container runtimes that'll be scalable, interoperable, and well integrated across the DOE. Um, we really need to support this notion that we can go from laptops to exascale. This is, you know, it sounds great to put on paper in a slide. I think it's going to be a lot of work to actually put in practice. So we need to start now, and that's, you know, that's what I'm here to do. Um, and we also really need to help our not only, you know, facilities that are going to be deploying these technologies, but also the application and the developers. Um, and, and those groups of people to best utilize containers and, and do so in an easy and performant way. Um, so we're going to take you know, a threefold approach here. We've got some R&D to do. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration that I think we're going to try and leverage. Uh, for instance, uh, Greg tomorrow is going to talk about SPAC. I think there's a lot of really great opportunities that, that we can, um, five minutes? OK. We can do this. Uh, that I think we can pull off. <laughs> Um, that, uh, that we're really excited about it in terms of integrating with SPAC. SPAC being a, uh, you know, HPC package management solution. Um, and there's a lot of opportunities for uh, fitting this into the DOE GitLab uh, and coming up with a nice CI pipeline uh, to truly, boy, wouldn't it be nice if every pull request that, you know, my AD, um, my ECP or Exascale uh, developer team puts together uh, it then goes and generates containers that are able to run on the A21 system or the next Coral 2 systems or, or my Astra system today. I think that's going to be our, our target. Um, and then just making sure people are, you know, well educated on how to use this. So, all right, so I'm going to try and wrap up here. This is of no surprise, you know, containers have taken hold in HPC. This is a reality in HPC, far more than we've ever been successful with virtualization. And that's, that, that's pretty great. I am super excited about that. I think we've demonstrated that Singularity has value, not only from a R and D perspective, but also on supporting our production mission workloads uh, for, for, at, you know, for and at Sandia. Performance is near native, but we have to be careful. I've mentioned this. ABI compatibility scares me. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to be able to, uh, uh, to come up with a better solution, whether that's Live Fabric or UCX or all the above. I don't know, but we need to start working on that. Um, and we really need to fo focus on some, uh, some of the fun problems that we're going to see at Exascale, because they're, they're not going to go away. They're just going to get worse. So where do I think this is all going? Again, I, I hope this to be future discussion points here. Um, if people are interested in this, come, come stop and talk to me. But you know, uh, we really need to make this work at Exascale. I think there's a, a great opportunity for a containerized CID, you know, CI and CD pipeline. Uh, there is going to be a GitLab a DOE wide GitLab service that I think is the right point to integrate here how I can integrate, say, the Singularity library services in there, I think are, are really fun questions. Uh, services, we continually see more people wanting to run services in microservice integration. How do we support that? I think, I think we're going to have some more talks on that later. Build time optimizations. How do I build the entire ECP software stack? And how do I do it in such a way that I don't create a 50 gigabyte container image? Um, we have some ideas. There's a lot of work to do here. I think multi-stage builds are fun and something that um, you know has a lot of progress, especially when you factor in you know a package management system that knows how to work with this as well. Um, so, and then yeah, is reproducibility still going to exist at, at, at this scale? Is that something that we can remotely approach um, at this point? I think that's an open question. So, especially when you want to define what is and isn't reproducibility. So I'll finish there. I think I'm exactly at 30 minutes. Uh, quick note, if, any other, if they're students, postdocs, whatever, you know, come talk to us. We're hiring, as probably anybody else in the room. And we've got two workshops here for ISC and hopefully a container-based workshop at SC as well. So thank you. <laughs>